to this computer. So, you know, expect what you saw in the first exam to be similar to what you see on this exam. Um, there are a couple of things that will be provided to you on this exam. For example, um, a periodic table, as well as that electronegativity chart. <clears throat> and then, so too will that one periodic table that showed the uh, rough number of atoms. That's not what I'm looking for. And of course, somebody is calling me at this exact moment. I closed the wrong PowerPoint. But okay, let's try this again. Um, that's the one. Okay, so what we're going to be doing today is really kind of elaborating on what we've seen previously. Um, we are going to be taking the next step, more or less, and we're going to be talking about the shape of a molecule. Now, when it comes to molecular shape, um, there's quite a bit to consider. When it comes to molecular shape, what we're really focusing on is basically, well, how do all of the electrons and how do all of the atoms of a molecule occupy three-dimensional space? Um, and so what you have to account for there is like each of the electrons, they're going to occupy a certain amount of space. In addition to that, those electrons are going to repel one another. And so as they repel one another, they're going to occupy different amounts of space. Um, so if we look at something like, sorry about that, the Lewis structure for something like helium. And thinking about what that helium, first of all, the helium nucleus, what, that, what does that consist of? That's going to be one proton and one neutron. Or, sorry, two protons and I believe one or two neutrons. Then we're also going to have a pair of electrons there. So this is two electrons compared to say neon, which has, well, it's got these eight electrons here. <clears throat> I think it's fairly intuitive to say that uh, two electrons will occupy a different amount of space than eight electrons. It's almost like, you know, two nails will occupy a different space than eight nails. So we have to account for all of that, not just when looking at individual atoms, but when looking at how these atoms bond with other atoms to make a molecule. What total space are they going to occupy? Now, this table, I want to bring this one back, and this is one that I'm going to provide to you. This is a very powerful and helpful one because it gives a good illustration and it gives a, or it gives a good illustration of what individual atoms look like in terms of their valence electrons and it identifies approximately how many bonds they like to form. So if we look for instance at fluorine. A fluorine atom has a total of uh, seven electrons what we want to look at is where are those electrons? Or sorry, it has a total of um, nine electrons, but what we're focused on is our seven valence electrons. Now, I want to bring this up. I mentioned it a little bit yesterday, but I want to double down on it here. These two electrons make up what is known as a LP or a lone pair. These electrons are also a lone pair. And these electrons right here are also a lone pair. So fluorine has its valence electrons configured in three lone pairs and one non-bonded electron. Now, if you look at chlorine, bromine, and iodine, you're going to see the exact same thing. Three lone pairs and one non-bonded pair, or one non-bonded electron. Sulfur and oxygen... Well, we've got one and two lone pairs and two non-bonded electrons. Nitrogen has one lone pair. Carbon has zero lone pairs. Zero LP. And then boron also has zero lone pairs of electrons. I want you to be comfortable with those, those terms, non-bonded electrons and lone pairs. 
A lone pair of electrons is also known as a non-bonded pair. So I'm going to go ahead and add this non-bonded pair. This is different from a single non-bonded or an unpaired, so non-bonded or unpaired electron. So essentially what this shows you, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, is it gives an illustration of approximately the number of bonds that one of these atoms likes to form. Fluorine, for instance, likes to form one bond. Bromine likes to form one bond. Iodine, fluorine, they each like to form one bond with another atom. Oxygen and sulfur, they both like to form two bonds because they have two unpaired electrons. Those unpaired electrons are going to find another atom with an unpaired electron, and they're going to share. They're going to make a covalent bond where they share those electrons. Now, here's a kind of an implementation of that. We have water, ammonia, and methane. This is illustrating basically those concepts that we just went over, where in a water molecule, we have oxygen, which likes to form one and two bonds, and also has one and two lone pairs of electrons. Ammonia has one lone pair of electrons and likes to form one, two, and three bonds with the adjacent hydrogen atoms. So I think that this is a good way. These are all sorts of uh, interchangeable ideas. If something has two lone pairs of electrons, so water, two LPs, it's pretty reasonable to say, okay, if it has two lone pairs of electrons, then it probably wants to form <clears throat> two bonds. Ammonia has one lone pair and likes to form three bonds. Essentially what this shows is, or essentially what this all adds up to is our octet rule. Atoms want to get eight electrons around them and they are either going to share, here's two, here's two, and here's two, or they'll have a single unbonded or a non-bonded pair, which is right here. Ammonia here has eight electrons surrounding it. Two, 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 and two. Now, what this all gives way to and what why this is important is I always kind of like to think about this as it's almost like Let's imagine that I'm going to use an N to H bond. This nitrogen nucleus and this hydrogen nucleus. Imagine that they are playing keep away. Like imagine that each one of these, this nitrogen and this hydrogen nuclei, there's a football or some sort of ball that they're passing between each other. That ball is basically... Yeah, something that they can pass between themselves. The shared electrons, denoted by this bond right here, what those electrons are going to do is they're going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They're going to run back and forth, back and forth. And what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to intercept that football. They're going to want to capture that ball. Now, what this means is that if we imagine the bond representing the person trying to get the ball, they're going to try to make as straight a line between nitrogen and hydrogen as possible because they don't want to waste any excess energy. And I'm just saying that this person who wants to get this ball that's being thrown, here's my football that's being thrown here and back. Well, this person right here, they want to make a very straight line. They want to kind of narrow the, 
the range in which they're kind of trying to get this ball. Now, by doing that, they're limiting wasted energy. They're not wasting any energy. They're just running back and forth, back and forth. They're kind of being contained between this nitrogen and this hydrogen. That's what the electrons are doing here. The shared electrons are going to be gravitating either towards this hydrogen or this nitrogen. And they're going to be doing so in as straight a line as they possibly can. So bond, if you were to look at a, on the atomic level, what does a bond look like? It really kind of looks like this. You know, color it in there. That's what a bond looks like. So those electrons that are being shared, they're occupying a pretty small space. Meanwhile, if we look at these electrons above the nitrogen atom, what are they being shared between? They're not being shared between anything. They're basically at the uh, kind of control of that nitrogen. And so what that means is that these electrons, they don't just set up shop right next to that nitrogen. Instead, what they do is they occupy space that looks like this. Now, I know that I, I have used kind of folksy, silly uh, examples, but I always think about it whenever, or I always think about it as similar to when my wife and I, I'm going to say JWG, KRG. Those are our initials. So we are the two nuclei. <clears throat> I'm a nucleus, she's a nucleus. I'm the nitrogen, she's the hydrogen. Okay. Now, if we go to the park with two of our kids, those two kids are going to run back and forth. This kid right here, this electron kid, is going to run as straight a line towards me as possible, and this one's going to run as straight a line towards her as possible. A uh, little bit of an aside, they're actually just going to run towards her. But anyway, anyway, um, you know, as they're running towards each other, they have the same kind of force, so they'll kind of repel one another. But they're going to run, and that's how they're going to, like the path that they beat down on the ground will look a little bit like this. So that's basically the, the range that they're going to occupy looks like that. Now, if on the contrary, I take two of my kids to the park and here's my two electron kids. And I say, all right, guys, um, listen, it's only me. Your mom's at home. Your mom's working. Uh, it's just me. So here's here's the deal. I have to be able to see you. That's the deal. You can go wherever you want as long as I can see you. And you know what? They find comfort in being able to see me as well. So what they're going to do is this one right here is going to run way the heck out here as far as he possibly can. This one right here is going to run way the heck out here as far as he possibly can in almost the opposite directions. And then when they get out here, they'll be like, well, that's pretty far. Uh, let's keep exploring. And so they're just going to kind of bounce around and go towards me as the nucleus. And what they're going to do is occupy arguably a larger space, a larger sphere, a larger range than when they are shared between two nuclei. Okay, I hope that was, the, the point of this is when unshared electrons occupy more space than shared electrons. And I use these examples just to illustrate why that is. So unshared electrons occupy a lot more space than shared electrons because those shared electrons have two kind of like beacons that they can run to, the, the two different atoms. I can run to this one or I can run to that one, vice versa. 
Now, this is all very important because we have this. This is a theory known as valent shell electron pair repulsion theory, also known as VESPER. Now, this is really just a mechanism or a way to describe the space that atoms and electrons will occupy. Now, if we were to look at something like HCN, that is cyanic acid. Now, let's look at each of our atoms, starting from the left. We've got hydrogen. It likes to have two electrons. Boom, that hydrogen has two electrons. Carbon likes to have eight electrons. Well, it's going to share two here, and then it's going to share six more here. So that carbon has eight electrons. Nitrogen here, what it's going to do is it's going to, it likes to have eight electrons, but it likes to have a lone pair of electrons. So this model right here, I've got one, two, three bonds and one lone pair of electrons. So this is what nitrogen likes to look like. Okay. Now this gives us the shape of a molecule of cyanic acid, HCN. This shows where all of these different electrons are being shared and where these atoms are with respect to one another. Now, if we drop down to H2O, water. Water has one hydrogen, which shares two electrons, another hydrogen, where it shares two electrons, and then it has one, two lone pairs of electrons. That gets us to a total of eight electrons around that oxygen. Now, the significant part of this is that we've got two non-bonded pairs or lone pairs, two lone pairs of electrons on oxygen. Now, these lone pairs, what they are going to look like is they are going to occupy more space than this and this bond, in which case what they are actually going to look like is here is one, two lone pairs. Here's a and here's the other lone pair. What these two are going to do is they're going to basically push down the shared pairs of electrons. So we're going to have a molecule that looks a little bit like this. Which, yes, is shown right here. But what this is showing is where these atoms are, where these nuclei are, with respect to one another. The two lone pairs of electrons, they are going to kind of assert themselves and take up a lot of space, take up more space than the shared pair of electrons. They're going to put pressure down and force down on these shared electrons. So they're going to be pushing that down there. Now, ultimately, what this means is that you might draw water like this and say, aha, perfect. Electrons up top, electrons up uh, on the bottom. But these electrons occupy a bunch of space, and so too do these. And so that's going to make our molecule not a linear molecule, but a bent molecule. Now, this is a summary of the first of the basics of Vesper theory. Now, Vesper theory is built on the idea of distinguishing bonded electron pairs and lone pairs of electrons. What we look for are what are known as electron domains. Now, an electron domain, if we bounce back, this is all being done with respect to a particular atom. So if we look at HCN and we look at that carbon, we'd say, okay, this carbon has one electron domain, and then this whole thing, this triple bond, is simply a second electron domain. So this carbon has two electron domains. So what we're doing is we're saying, all right, well, how many electron domains does our carbon have? And I'm going to go ahead and draw my HCN here. My carbon has two lone pair or two bonded atoms the hydrogen, and nitrogen. How many lone pairs? Well, this is all with respect to 
are carbon. There are zero lone pairs on that carbon. So what is the shape of our molecule? It is completely linear. Now, if we then go on to our, and so what that means is that this hydrogen right here is exactly 180 degrees from this nitrogen. This hydrogen is 180 degrees from that nitrogen because it has two electron domains. Now, next up, if we were to take a molecule like, let's go with uh, BF3. BF3, okay. So let's bounce back for a second. Let's build this. Boron, right here, B, likes to have three bonds going to it. So what that's going to look like is our boron right here, F, 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 okay. So we're evaluating this with respect to our boron. How many bonded atoms does boron have here? It's got three. How many lone pairs of electrons does boron have? It has zero. Now, how many does um, fluorine have? Each fluorine atom has three lone pairs of electrons. So the molecular geometry of that fluorine versus that bromine or uh, uh, that boron, they're going to be different from one another. But this boron in BF3, three bonded atoms, zero lone pairs. The geometry of this is trigonal planar. So what that means is that all of these atoms are flat on the same surface, and they are 120 degrees from one another, which is what we're seeing right here. Now, the molecular shape of something with two bonded atoms and a lone pair of electrons would be considered bent. So that atom looks like, I'm just using A as a placeholder, and then X as another placeholder. This right here would be an example of something that has three electron domains. Two of them represent bonded atoms, and then the last one is a lone pair of electrons. These get a lot more complicated, when, especially when you exceed more than four uh, domains. We're going to limit our study to four domains. But keep in mind, something like H2O. Well, let's see. Here's an electron domain. Here's a second. Here's a third. Here's a fourth. It has four domains. Two of them are for bonded atoms, and two of them are for lone pairs which is how we arrive at bent as the molecular shape. Now, I will give you questions on your exam that ask about this Vesper theory. And I will give something like this. So water, as a placeholder, I'm going to use A as my central atom. X as my bonded atoms. So I'm going to put X subscript 2. And then I'll put E to represent the lone pairs. So that would be AX2, E2 is this right here. So I can give you that, or I will give you that. I could ask a question like, what is the bond angle? Or what is the molecular shape? If we were to take something like AX3, E, that would be three adjacent atoms and one lone pair of electrons. AX3, E, that is a trigonal pyramidal molecule. Now, all of that is very valuable because what we can do with that is build on what we talked about yesterday when we were talking about bonds being polar or nonpolar. We classified bonds as being um, covalent, nonpolar, covalent, polar, and ionic. And we looked at the electronegativity of those. Now, 
we had this depiction where we looked at what was known as a dipole, where A and B have different electronegativities. B here, I'm drawing the arrow here and here, is more electronegative than A. Now, when we look at this right here, which is a nonpolar covalent bond? So we are looking for nonpolar covalent would be 0 to 0 0.4. That's our electronegativity difference. HF, our difference there is 1.9. So that's out. CF. That difference is 1.5. I'm taking the absolute value difference of my electronegativities. FF, Ooh, enticing. This is zero. NH is going to be 0 0.9. So that's out. OH is 1.4. Also out. So we are left with C as our nonpolar covalent bond. Now, this Vesper theory, just another depiction of this. What's important to know is that we have this sense of the geometry based on the space that these different electron domains occupy. Um, but what we also need to take into consideration is, well, does polarity influence this? It does a little bit. This gives us an idea of how polar a bond is and how polar an atom is, or sorry, sorry, how polar a bond is and how polar a molecule is. Now, if we look at something like CO2, what's the molecular shape of CO2? Okay, so in order to put this together, here's what we wanna do. Look at this. Carbon likes to have four bonds. So this is like the preferred model for carbon. And the preferred model for oxygen looks a little bit like this. Now what this tells us is the number of valence electrons each one of these is bringing into the show. Carbon is bringing four valence electrons. Oxygen is bringing in, here's one, here's two, here's two, and here's one. Oxygen is bringing in six. So what we can do is add up the number of valence electrons that oxygen is bringing in. And there are two oxygens. So I'm going to say two times six. That gets us to 12. 12 valence electrons. 12 plus four gives us 16 valence electrons. So if we were to draw oxygen, oxygen, something like that, well then, hmm, that accounts for that bond and that bond, that bond, and then of course we've got another oxygen over here. But also, if we were to do what's known as a double bond, throw that in there, then we can have a structure like this, where each oxygen has two bonds, each has two bonds, and two bonds, two lone pairs. I'm going to add up my electrons. Two, be four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So this gets me my 16 electrons. Okay, now this is the sort of question that we went through the process of drawing this. On your exam, I'll give you a molecule and ask you for the shape. Drawing a molecule isn't really a isn't a priority of this class, 
but being able to process the information based on a, a structure. That's what I want you to be able to do. Now, if we look at carbon and we say, how many electron domains does that carbon have? Well, here's one. Here's a second. So this has two electron domains. How many lone pairs does carbon have? So I'm going to say that carbon has zero lone pairs. The fact that these are double bonds doesn't matter. Each double bond is, or sorry, a double bond is a um, electron domain just as a single bond is a um, electron domain just as a lone pair is an electron domain. So our carbon here has two electron domains, zero lone pairs, meaning that our molecule which has two domains, zero lone pairs, two bonded atoms, we have a linear molecule. Now, when we look at a molecule, what I also want you to be able to do is take a picture of a molecule, and by that I mean be given a picture of a molecule, and classify it as polar or nonpolar. Now, you can do that based on bonds. But what's more important is to be able to identify if that molecule is asymmetric or if it's symmetric. If a molecule is asymmetric, so here we've got a carbon in the center, a hydrogen, and a nitrogen on either side, this is considered a polar molecule. Now, water always throws people for a loop because they look at it and they say, well, on the left, I've got a hydrogen, and on the right, I've got a hydrogen. Now I've got two lone pairs of electrons on each side of the oxygen. Okay, well, this is completely symmetrical. you got to remember what's happening. These lone pairs of electrons, they're going to occupy a bunch of space here and here. I always kind of imagine they make these little, like, big earlobes. They look like rabbit ears almost. And so this molecule... Keeping in mind that these atoms and these electrons are in constant motion, water is an asymmetric molecule. CO2 is a nonpolar molecule. It has the same bonded atoms and does not have a lone pair on the central atom, which we just drew that out a second ago. So one thing to keep in mind is we have to remember where are we drawing this from or what, what is our perspective? Well, our perspective is that central atom. So the fact that oxygens, each of the oxygens here have lone pairs of electrons really doesn't impact us at all. What we're more interested in is what does that central carbon have? That central carbon has two lone pairs of electrons, or sorry, um, two bonded pairs in the form, or two electron domains in the form of uh, double bonds. Now, if we were to also take a look at something like here, what this has is four electron domains. This is ammonia. These four electron domains, it's got three bonded pairs or BPs and one LP or lone pair. So we've got four electron domains, three bonded pairs and one lone pair. Now this is asymmetric because, again, this lone pair of electrons is going to occupy a bunch of space. And it almost makes this look like a, uh, how do I describe it? It basically puts the, here's a hydrogen, one, two, three. These hydrogens, I'm drawing this as, as well as I can. This hydrogen that I just put an underline in, that's in the background. So that's, you have depth to this. And then here's our lone pairs of electrons way up here. Now that's very similar to CH3Cl. This is formaldehyde. And what this is going to do is you've got a Cl, C, H, H. This is asymmetric because chlorine is different. So we can classify a molecule as asymmetric and therefore polar if it has different bonded atoms or 
at least one lone pair on the central atom. So if the atoms are different or it has at least one lone pair, then it would be asymmetric and polar. Now, BF3, we have the same bonded atoms and does not have a lone pair on the central atom. This boron right here, we've got three bonded pairs going to boron to fluorine, boron to fluorine, boron to fluorine. There are no lone pairs of electrons on that boron because if we bounce back right here, boron right here has three bonded pairs. So it likes to form three bonds. It doesn't need to form four bonds. It is an exception to the octet rule. Okay, so these are the different ways in which you can classify a molecule as being polar or nonpolar. If you have different bonded atoms or at least one lone pair on the central atom, has the same bonded atoms and does not have a lone pair on the central atom. Just a couple of different examples. Now, that's all that I've got for today. What I think you should expect for this upcoming exam is to be given, like, I could give you a structure. I could give you, heck, this right here. For BF3, I'm going to go ahead and stop. Oh, yeah, BF3. I'm going to keep my recording going. That BF3, I could ask you a couple of things. I could ask you, what is the name of this compound? And then you'd have to see, okay, boron, and there's three fluorines. Okay, is this a mixture of noble, or sorry, nonmetals? Yes, it is. Therefore, this is a covalent compound, okay? Now, then I could ask you, how would you classify the polarity of these bonds, the boron to fluorine bond? In which case, then you'd look at this right here and you'd say, okay, this is B to F. Oh, man, that's an electronegativity difference of almost ionic proportions. It's an electronegativity difference of two. So it's not quite ionic, but it is a uh, covalent polar bond. In addition to that, I could ask you, is this molecule symmetric, asymmetric? And how many domains does it have? And what's the molecular shape of this molecule? So just to rehash, I'm going to give you this. I, I'm going to erase my notes and everything like that, but I'll give you this. I will also give you this table right here. So I'll have these two um, available. You might have to toggle between questions whenever you're answering questions, um, just so it doesn't take up a whole lot of memory and doesn't take so long to load. But I'll give you these two as well as a complete periodic table. Now, this table right here, you're going to have to understand this. You're going to have to be able to process this. Now, BF3, just as an example, BF3 versus NH3. I will draw a lone pair of electrons if they're there. So if I gave you BF3, I gave you this structure. Well, I'm not going to draw a lone pair of electrons on that boron because it's not there. Is it possible that you might get tripped up and think, oh, boron has to have a lone pair of electrons? Yeah, it's possible. You got to be aware of that. But you'll also have this reference of this table right here where you can look back at it and say, oh, okay, boron does not have a lone pair of electrons because here I see everything that has lone pairs of electrons. So this table, this table, and a comprehensive periodic table or a complete periodic table, I'm going to give to you. Um, you have a quiz. Okay, so you have... Two quizzes, one from Wednesday, one from Thursday, that are due today at 2 p.m. So you have two quizzes that are due today at 2 p.m. You have another quiz that goes up today at 12 p.m. Then your exam on Monday is, again, going to be 9.30 until 1 p.m. Um, you'll have, I think I gave you 75 minutes or 100 minutes. I can't remember exactly. I'm going to use the exact same time frame. Um, there will be some questions from the old exam or from the old material just because this is a, a kind of uh we're doing cumulative exams um 
Uh, but I would definitely focus on this newest stuff. Okay, well, I'm going to stop my recording right there.